this channel we've talked about heroes, villains, and we discussed how I believe you should do them in the right and wrong way. And don't get me wrong, I still stand by my videos on the matter, but you really need to consider likability and non-desirability for characters. But here's a question, why would you want to make a terrible character? When I'm talking about a terrible character, I'm talking about making them unlikable, although the writing can easily make a character terrible, and even though we're supposed to like the character, it falls flat. But for the purposes of this video, I think we should actually look at the rights and wrongs of making terrible characters, whether on purpose or accidental. Hi, I'm Manga Kamen, and this is the right and wrong way to make terrible characters. Spoilers for the following games and shows. To start this video off, I want to say that there's a difference between making a terrible character and a terrible person. Oftentimes, and even when I talked about this on Twitter, there was a bit of confusion on what I meant when I'm talking about terrible characters. A terrible character is a character who is written in a way that conflicts with what is supposed to be done. I know that's confusing, but let's give a quick example and one I won't dwell on too long for the sake of my editor and I don't want him to go crazy. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! I know, I know, I've beaten this horse to death, but let's really get into this for a second, since this character is quite divisive. Opinions on the net will often label this blue hair angst machine as either very relatable or as a terrible person, and that's very good, since it shows there's a range of ways to interpret a character. A character who does terrible things but is ultimately supposed to be liked overall to me is a risk. And like I said, a lot of people do relate to Chloe Price, but I and many others can't stand the character. And trust me, if you saw the spoiler disclaimer, we'll be coming back to this point later. Not for naught, if you happen to like characters who do bad things, and you find them relatable, no, I'm not trying to proclaim that my opinion is the objective one. These bids I make are only with my perspective, but I don't think that I'm the one whose thoughts are only correct. Back on topic, if your character does terrible things, you need to consider the purpose of the character. If the audience is meant to cheer for them or despise them, for example, if you have a character who does terrible things but has a reason to do so, then you can have justification to it. Then you can still have the character be a likable to a degree. However, if your goal is to make the character be hated by the players or audience, then having them do terrible things is a good way to do that, since it's pretty much human nature for people to despise those people who do terrible things. Kamoshida from Persona 5 is an excellent example of this. Energy from earlier go. A peasant like you isn't worth beating. He's a terrible person, but ultimately is well written as a character because he fulfills the role of being a prime example of an adult who abuses power and role, and it works towards the overall themes of the story. If you're not familiar with Persona 5's debut villain, Kamoshida is a gym teacher who used to compete in the Olympics, and as such would use his fame to bring prestige to Sujin Academy. Insert 2024 France Olympics joke here. Because of this position, and how his name would bring more attention to the school, he would get favoritism from the principal and other higher ranking officials. This in turn inflated his ego and made him believe that he was above other people, especially the students. To the point where he's able to break a teenager's leg, blackmail a student in attempts to coerce her into misappropriate sexual acts, and sexually assault another female student to the point where she was willing to end her life. None of the students would speak up about this, though, so Kamoshida would continue abusing his power and the teens under his care. Kamoshida is an effective villain, and at the same time, he's a terrible person. Persona 5 does a good job of establishing him as a character in this way, so he's effectively a character you want the players to hate and give good justification for said hate. Now, on the other side of that coin, if you spend so much time having your character do bad things, then expect the audience to forget that and try to make them likable or relatable, it can at the very least make your audience divided. I'm sure most of you already can think who this accurately describes, especially in the gaming world. Over the years, I've become a lot less jaded towards The Last of Us 2, and while I don't think it's a great game or even a good one, I don't outright hate it. However, what the game does to make me hate the secondary lead, Abby, is something to address. Before we get into that, we need to talk about first impressions. They are important because they will be the basis for how people will see your characters. So strong impressions are necessary to make the character memorable, and that can be done negatively and positively, especially for terrible characters. To get off the topic for a moment, I've recently been watching Rio Soldier, the Super Sentai season of 2019. It's a flawed season for sure, but one of the things for me is how they introduced one of the secondary major antagonists, Wise Rule. How we're introduced to the character is rather compromising. Now, that's certainly flashy and memorable, but the issue I have with the character is that he kind of just comes out of nowhere, and that sucks. 
since I do actually like Wise Rule, especially in some of his later scenes. Like, you can't tell me having a stage show where you're controlling two of the main characters like puppets and singing a song about it isn't entertaining. But he comes out of nowhere and that does hurt the character as a villain. Yes, he does have a strong introduction, but because there's no real setup for the character, there needs to be a lot more emphasis for that introduction, since he needs to establish the character's personality, abilities, and much more in such a short amount of time. And that is the ultimate issue with Abby, since the introduction established her character pretty well. Because when we start the game, we see her wanting revenge, getting saved by the guy who she wants to kill, and then... I'm going to rush this. This established characterization will stick with a lot of players, and since that's the only actual interaction that the players will have with the character for hours on end while playing the game, that ultimately be the only interpretation we'll have up until you can switch characters. For those who are not aware, you eventually play as Abby in the game, but that's not until hours later, and even then, the game tries its damnedest for the players to see her point of view. I'm not gonna say it can't work, but considering how divisive this game was back in the day, it's hard for me to say that's a good idea to do it this way. For some people, it's hard to get really above of that murder, especially when it comes off as if the game is trying to dogpile you with Abby's backstory and make you go all oh, sad. Going back to Kamoshida, technically speaking, what I talked about isn't the first impression that we the players have with the character. Hell, the first interaction that we have, Kamoshida is actually loud and nice and offers the main character a ride to school. It's only after that when we enter Mementos that we can actually see Kamoshida's true colors. The reason why I don't have an issue with this false first impression, and while I do have one with Abby, is that we see Kamoshida for what he really is almost immediately after. The same could have been done with Abby had the game shifted between Abby and the other player character, Ellie, in the game, where over the course of the game we get snippets of Abby's life and reasoning for why she chose to kill Joel. Because the longer that we have that first impression, without being contradicted, the longer it'll sit with the audience. And if it takes hours of gameplay to have that happen, it makes it hard for what to be changed since that impression becomes set in our heads. At least that's how I view it. When you're making a terrible person, the goal of the character is to have the audience root against them. This is what you want to do with your villains. After all, the ultimate goal of a story is that you want the main characters to become victorious. <laughs> Sometimes, though, characters who do terrible things can still be overly liked by the audience, especially if they're silver-haired pretty boys with an obsession with their mother and a sword that is obviously compensating for something- Not again! And by making a villain who's designed to be hated by the audience, you can uplift your protagonist by sheer virtue. I mean, it's hard to make a guy who's willing to make an entire nation of people into slaves into the person you want to root for to win the fight, and that's by design. And it should be simple to do that, right? Call me Dick Master. Well, you would think so. You see, there's a difference between making a character hateable and making them insufferable. You do get the same result of the character being hated by both the protagonists and the audience, but it comes with a cost, and that cost is the actual death of a character. I feel this way about Adam from Hasman Hotel, and this shouldn't be a surprise to people if you're familiar with my content. I've made it no secret I am not a fan of this character. Yeah, he certainly gets a job done to become unlikable. All of mankind came from these fucking nuts! Adam, the first man, the man who becomes the leader of the Angel's mass executions of demons, and one of the worst kinds of villains that I hate, and not in the good way. Here's the thing, Adam does work for being an unlikable character but he does it in one of the cheapest ways possible. He's crass, he's misogynistic, he's a dude bro, and is essentially no better than your standard demon with how he goes about his mass murder sprees. Especially since killing demons is pretty much just a means of entertainment for Adam and the other angels under his command. So you do have a very blatant reason why the main cast and even the audience would want to see Adam fail. He's literally a piece of garbage and a huge dick, as he likes to proclaim. Dick master. And that's fine, if you want a jackass who's one-dimensional, doesn't really do much to really flesh him out as an antagonist, sure, it's fine to have a cartoonish D-bag who has a decent song and is more comedic, but that doesn't make him memorable, nor does it make him a great character. Again, if you're wanting a character who's just meant to be hated, that's fine, it works there. But at that point, the character's just basically a piece of cardboard, and we're now just waiting for the next villain who could potentially be just as expendable. Just because a character can get the job done, that doesn't make them a great character. It's like saying a McDonald's burger is on the same par as a Smash burger. Yeah, it'll fill you up, but it's one of the cheapest meals around, and it certainly ain't good for you. Especially when you have such an interesting concept that Adam has. You have the very first man, at least in the Bible, a person who, if you follow the teachings of, was already in paradise, but due to temptation was forced out and had to suffer a human life with its miseries. It was because of sin that he got in that situation, 
and thus he would hate sinners because he crawled his way out of that temptation and became, well, an angel. It's missed potential that's just left to the side to really expand the character. You can still make him an egotistical dick, but you'd also be able to flesh him out and at least make his motivations a little more nuanced other than he's bored. Now we can talk about lost potential all we want, but it's because of that lack of nuance for the character that any sort of speculation on the greater themes of, is heaven corrupt? is just immediately tossed out the window and, oh, these guys are just the bad guys automatically. Having an unlikable character like Adam does paint the angels in the wrong, since how could a dick like him be allowed in heaven? But what about the other people who are sinners? It removes the nuance right there. Now, nuance isn't exactly a prerequisite to make an unlikable character, but it does make them a lot more interesting to talk about. So, in that vein, Let's talk about Jujutsu Kaisen. You are my Now, I'm a little of a crossroads with the series, especially with its odd their Gege, but that's mostly with his stuff of the death of characters and that mindset. But that's for a different video, because that's not the point of this one. The point is that Gege can create some very terrible characters, and for the purposes of this one, let's talk about Mahito. Let's give a small rundown who aren't familiar with Jujutsu Kaisen. Mahito is a cursed spirit, the main monsters of the series, with Mahito being one of the primary antagonists and a recurring villain for a good portion of the series, at least up until the end of the Shibuya arc. Mahito is an immature character, but he's also sadistic, and that plays into his terrible tendencies as well, with the first real action he does in the story is to meet up with a character named Junpei, and after demonstrating his powers to the audience on three bully characters... And I thought Scary Movie had an overreaction with people talking on their cell phone. Mahito has the ability to warp souls, and in the process disfigure people's bodies. It's a very surprising versatile ability that is dangerous whenever we see the character fight, since most of the time he just needs to touch you once, and he's won. And since he's a cursed spirit, he doesn't really view human life all that valuable. Hell, he actually sees cursed spirits as true humans. He'll toy with people's minds and lives, even literally, even helping the young man get into the cursed techniques because he saw Junpei as a toy. And the moment that Junpei wasn't of any more use or fun, Mahio turned him into his monster and killed him without a moment's notice, laughing all the while. <laughs> So it should be obvious that we as the audience should hate this character, especially since he does claim the lives of other characters in the manga and anime, including probably one of the more popular characters too. I did warn about spoilers. Mahito is a character that, while I wouldn't say is nuanced as other villains, he's still a terrible person, but an amazing character because he does the role well. Mahito's philosophy of doing whatever he wants is shown in his actions, and while there's a motivation to make cursed spirits being the dominant beings on life, that's not really Mahito's motivation for what he does. He just finds it fun to kill and torment others. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, it's a similar motivation to Adam, killing for fun and entertainment. It's part of the reason why I'm making a comparison between these two, and sure, you can say that's a pretty tenuous point of comparison. Well, other than the fact they were supposed to hate them. But hey, you can always make your own video if you want. I'm just one guy. Still, the question remains, why do I think Mahito is a terrible person done well and Adam isn't? It's simple, it's how they go about it. Mahito is a psychotic monster who gets his kicks, from killing people, but he also does it in a manner that messes with people both on a psychological manner and obviously in the physical manner. Mahito doesn't need to be blatant about being a terrible person, he just lets his actions do the talking for him, and it doesn't scrape the bottom of the barrel to do it. If anything, see him being an absolute monster works more since he's a literal monster, and he doesn't need to be an annoying dude bro to be unlikable. He still acts as a good foil to the main character too, Yuji Itadori, since Yuji values life and believes that people should receive a proper death. And because of that, Yuji believes that's morally unethical for him to take the life of another human. But thanks to Mahito's power, Mahito forces Yuji to go against that morality since Mahito can use human souls and bodies as weapons, and will use them against Yuji who does need to break them and have to get to Mahito. Both Mahito and Adam of characters do their jobs to be hated not only by the main characters, but also the audience. But to, but to me, I find Mahito does the job better because you don't need to make him an annoying caricature. Obviously, it should go without saying that this is my interpretation of the characters, as well as my comparison. I know for a fact that there are plenty of people who find Adam to be compelling as a character. I may not understand why those people think that, but hey, this is an opinion piece, so take it as you will. 
There's nothing wrong with making an irredeemable monster for a character. Hell, I like JoJo villains. I make videos talking about them. And one of the most iconic, Dio, is a character who will kick dogs, burn them alive, rip out people's teeth, force you to drive on the sidewalk, and then use your corpse as a projectile. That is a sentence I just typed out and said. That's the tamer stuff, too! And that's not getting to the fact that Dio nonchalantly made people eat cat. Dio is a monster and a terrible person, obviously, but he's often toted as a great character. He does terrible things, but he has some class and nuance to him. After all, Dio, before he was even adopted into the Joestar family, was basically forced to live in an abusive household and had to do whatever he could to survive. It's not hard to see how a person like Dio could become that way when raised in such an environment and how he was taught that it's a world where the weak are used by the strong. Point is, we're supposed to dislike the characters, and it's easy to do that with villains, but you also have to make them somewhat appreciable. But there's a big difference between making them characters you love to hate, but rather characters who are just meant to be hated. But what about protagonists who are terrible people? It's not the first time I've talked about protagonists and other characters who are less than ideal. Hell, most people will probably think of a certain blue-haired girl that I've talked about endlessly. Hella yes! But since I'm waiting for the next Life is Strange game to come out, and yes, there is another one of those on the horizon, let's put her to the side and save her for a different video. Instead, let's talk about the other character that I initially talked about with that series. Fuckhead! It's no stretch of the imagination to say that Travis Touchdown is a terrible person, and here's a long list of reasons why. He's a loser, living in a dirty, cramped apartment that is actually a renovated hotel. He only has one real friend, who he gets killed in the second game. He's a stereotypical otaku, complete with wearing the shirts and having posters of the scantily clad young ladies in that dirty apartment. Mwah. And, of course, the fact he kills countless people. Here's your ticket to paradise, old man. And for what reason is he doing that? Okay, how about this? If I become number one, will you do it with me? He wants to get laid! Hope oh, it. Now, obviously with all these traits, Travis Touchdown isn't a great guy, and yet people enjoyed the character. And he managed to get quite a few games there he stars in them. And that's because Travis is a satire of action heroes and the violence in video games. He's an entertaining character despite the fact that he's a horrible person. And the thing is, despite all of that, Travis does eventually grow up. When he defeats Holly Summers and she takes her own life when Travis refuses to kill her, it's then he starts to actually take the assassination rankings more seriously. And when his master dies in the third ranking, it gets a bit more serious for Travis. The life of being an assassin is not as glamorous as he would have imagined. Still, he's not completely changed. This is just a reminder for you to return one of our videos. It's titled 69 Techniques to Improve Your Love Making. It's overdue by two weeks. Be sure to return it to us soon. Then again, the game is all about this sort of thing. That there is some tedium in the gameplay to get the cool stuff. What you have to do is get odd jobs to earn money to actually get to the matches and the actual good part of the game. Point is, Travis in the first game is an asshole who started to get some self-reflection going on. Not bad for a shit-headed perverted otaku who was only scraping by. It's in the second game where his only friend Bishop dies, and it's because Travis killed someone in the first game. It was in a side mission you wouldn't really care about. But it showed that there was Travis was starting to learn how to care for others in his life, including those he fought before. He actually understood that his actions have consequences. And I'm not going to go through the entirety of No More Heroes as a series for this video, but when you have your terrible characters being the player character, it's best to acknowledge that your characters do terrible things, embrace what they're doing isn't terrible, and eventually grow out of those horrible behaviors. Hell, there's a reason why Travis eventually becomes the savior of the Earth against the aliens. It's also a good number of reasons why the Disgaea protagonists often fall underneath this, and that they're demons, and makes a lot of sense that they would grow over the course of the story, and yet still have some eccentricities. I mean, if you want to consider dissecting someone who's still alive as an eccentricity, more power to ya! I understand that Disgaea 3 in and of itself is a bit of a divisive title for a lot of reasons in this series, but I enjoyed it! And I did find that Mao as a main character to be entertaining, especially since he is a horrible person. Hell, at the start of the game, he's looking to kill his father for stepping on his video games and destroying all his saved data. We later learned that he was so petty that he basically helped the main antagonist of the game, the hero Aram, kill his father. Mao told Aram his father's weaknesses, all for an autograph. 
Then again, Mao did think that heroes don't kill their opponents in cold blood, so... Again, the story does what it does, and although Mao would always deny it, he does get a bit of a heel turn throughout the story. So he is a horrible person, but he does learn. The little brat still doesn't wash his hands, though, not since he was born. Ugh! To round this video out, I want to examine at how at points you want to have terrible people to express the message that you want to get throughout your story. I do need to give an additional spoiler warning at this point, however, since I'm going to be spoiling pretty big details about an entire game, Lost Judgment. So if you want to skip this portion, I don't blame you at all. I'll have a little extra time to get to the next chapter, so let's have a little bit of fun with the best EX action in the entire game. Dog always kicks ass. And with that out of the way, I'm going to assume that you either clicked away, you don't care about spoilers, or your thumbs got broken in the span of 18 seconds. I apologize, I hope you have insurance for your thumbs, but we're moving on. To give a quick rundown on the plot of Lost Judgment, as well as the character we're talking about, Kuwana Jin, we need to establish his past. Kuwana Jin was a former high school teacher, just a regular guy, until one day, a student of his was being subjected to bullying. Kuwana was made aware of the situation, but didn't take it too seriously, telling the bullies not to take it too far. Unfortunately, the bullying escalated, and another character who shows up in the game later, Sawa, informs Kuwana about how most half of the class was bullying the student. So Kuwana decided to set up a hidden camera in the class and saw just how savage the bullying was getting, beating the student senselessly, stripping him out of his clothes, and even recording the situation on their phones. Unfortunately, before Kuwana could watch the footage to learn about this, the bullied student had taken his own life by jumping off the roof of the school. The school got wrapped up in controversy, and the bullies threw one of their own under the bus, and he essentially got the rest off scot-free. Afterwards, Kuwana resigned as a teacher, and this would push him into becoming a vigilante of sorts. We eventually learn through the story that Kuwana hunts down the bullies who weren't punished by the legal system, or will blackmail them into helping him through his pursuits of other killings. Kuwana becomes what is called a mission-oriented serial killer, meaning he kills people who he views as undesirable, more specifically, a kind of people. And for this specific example, it's bullies. That person's just a big, big bully! So fast. And bullying is a major theme of Lost Judgment, and how the justice system tends to not be equipped to handle these delicate situations. In that case, Kuwana takes his own form of justice in his own hands and kills those who he considers to be for the greater good. How can this be for the greater good? The greater good. Shut it! And here's where a terrible character comes into play. Kuwana does terrible things, blackmailing and murdering people. And throughout the game, we see that there are people who do get caught in the crossfire. The character Sawa I brought up is an example of that, and while I have my issues with how her death was used in the story afterwards, I will admit that it shows the irony that Kuwana had gotten Sawa killed even though she was the one who told him about the bullies all the years prior. And here's where we gotta talk about the terrible person writing. Yes, Kuwana is a terrible person, but he has a motivation that I'm sure a lot of us would be behind to make sure people who bully others actually face repercussions for their terrible behavior. But because of this, a question is proposed to the players when dealing with Kuwana. Is he in the wrong for this? Now, obviously, to me and to a whole bunch of other people, killing someone, even in revenge, is something I do not agree with. But that doesn't mean that Kuwana doesn't have a point. The justice system is flawed, and at some points, it doesn't strive to protect the people who need it to. That's the point that's being made, but at the same time, you don't want to agree with Kuwana's methods, especially since he doesn't consider a few of the following elements. The first is prevention of the bullying. There isn't really a push for Kuwana to try to make a change for the system, electing to operate in the shadows instead and to commit crimes. And the second is that most of the time, the bullies are still teenagers and still have a chance to improve as people. And that's something that we do see happen in Lost Judgment's story, where after beating up some teenagers... <laughs> We eventually see the students who were bullies come around. It's partially because of the smackdowns, but it's also because they're learning of the real-life consequences of bullying. The point is though, Kuwana found an issue with the system, and while his methods are obviously questionable, it's more in line that his motivations do make sense and allow the players to actually see something in a new light. Huh. 
You know what this reminds me of? Nano Machine Son! Much like Kuwana, Armstrong has a goal that could be considered noble the idea of ending war by becoming president. And he does actually manage to raise a good point about how our society is. Fuck all these lunatic lawyers and chicken shit bureaucrats! Fuck this 24 7 internet spew of trivia and celebrity bullshit! <laughs> Though that last point cuts a little deeper than I would like to myself, much like other people like Armstrong, though they may have a noble goal, it's the way they go about it that's the issue. After all, Armstrong's goal is to become the president, as he could break the current one in two. And to do that, he needs capital. Of course, there are a ton of other ways to amass capital that don't require you to scoop out kids' brains, start wars, or even kill other people. But alas, he does, because it's probably the fastest way that he can think of. And it's why a lot of people do enjoy characters like Kuwana and Armstrong, even though they are terrible people. They have noble goals, but those noble goals get twisted and skewed, and it allows others to understand why they do the things they do. They're terrible people who do horrible things, but it doesn't mean that they're written horribly. And they're not meant to be cheered upon by the audiences, regardless of how their motivations spark them. Their actions are what makes it hard to agree with them. And in that case, these types of characters make you think. Terrible characters are meant to make the audience and players think which is ultimately why we want to see terrible people in our media so we can learn from them and see a different perspective. Sure, it can be a perspective that you do not agree with, but that's the beauty of media, which allows you to see different perspectives without harming any people who are actually alive. We need characters who are terrible people, especially in the media. They can serve a lot of narrative tools for the audience and players, and let's face it, things would be boring as all hell if we just had squeaky clean characters everywhere. But just because you have a terrible person as a character, that doesn't automatically make them a bad character. However, by that same token, just because a character has a reason to be a bad person, that doesn't excuse their actions. It really all depends on what the role of the character is and how we, the audience, are supposed to take them. <gasps> It's often pointed out that if a hero does terrible things, it never gets pointed out, it makes the character bad. I mean, it's hard to take a character who wants to cancel people, manipulate people, or bully people, and you're supposed to root for a person who does those things? Well, it would certainly explain a lot about online culture and how people act. Now, I'm obviously being hyperbolic about that somewhat, but when we look at terrible people for characters, we understand what their roles are, and how the author wants us to perceive them, and how their setup is done. It's a careful balance that can be tricky depending on what the role of the character is. Making a villain a terrible person? Oh, that's easy, since we're supposed to dislike them intrinsically. Support character? Well, that... Wait, I never really went through that. Oops, we'll save that for another video sometime. Protagonist? That's a little bit more tricky, especially if we're supposed to support and root for the character. I'm not gonna say that what I said is gonna be the be-all and end-all, because unlike what a lot of people online like to think or say, I don't think my opinion is the one true one. I can only give examples of what I'm talking about, and how I would view the topic. Do I want some things that I complain about to go the way I want? Obviously, what human doesn't want that? But now it's your guys' turn. Tell me, what villain, what character, what support role do you think is a terrible person, but is written well? And hey, almost 200k of you people want to hear what I think on these topics, but I want to hear what you guys think. I thank you guys, and look forward to the next video. I'm Common, and thanks for watching. Later.